Hello, welcome to another episode in the Mono Game tutorial series. Today, we are going to be building a platformer controller. We're going to be using the code from the previous tutorial to make this go by a little bit quicker. If you don't have that or you don't want to set anything up, the code is linked in the description exactly as I wrote it. There are a couple changes. I've commented out the um, debug information like drawing the hitboxes because I think it's a little bit distracting. If in case you don't uh, know, if we can run this code here and this is what we're given. We have a player represented by a sprite and then we have the tile map that we're using here. So let's go ahead and do this. So we need a way to move a sprite and give it some basic physics. So for this, I have the class that we had before with the texture, the rect, which is our destination rectangle, the source rect, and then a velocity component. The first thing we wanna do is get this player moving left and right. So you'll see here that we have this update method. And this update method has takes in the keyboard state, which is the current you know, key, keys being pressed or not pressed, the previous keyboard state, which is the state of the keyboard before that, so one frame before, and then the game time, which we're gonna be using for delta time. If you wanna know how to get these in the game1.cs, I have it right here. In player.update, we just call keyboard.getState to grab the current keyboard state. We store the previous keyboard state as a private member field up here, and we just assign it here. And then we just pass in the game time that is given to us automatically. Okay, so let's get this thing moving. So we wanna make it respond to keyboard presses. So I'm gonna say if keyState.isKeyDown keys dot right now let's move it right now we don't want to directly affect the position because the way that collisions work we check for the velocity and the velocity tells us what direction we're moving in and so what we want to do is we want to affect this velocity component and then later on use that to translate the position of the player so if we move right we want to set the velocity to something positive so we're moving in the right direction i'm going to say a hundred for now and additionally i'll also say if key state that is key down, keys dot left. Then I want to set velocity dot x equal to negative 100. Finally, we want to actually apply the velocity because as it stands, there's nothing actually applying the velocity here. So what we'll do is we'll just do, uh, we'll just go into game one, and I believe that we do it right here. So in the previous tutorial, we applied the velocity, and then we checked for horizontal collisions, and then we applied the vertical velocity, and then we checked for horizontal or vertical collisions. And the reason that I do it like this is because if we apply the um, horizontal velocity and the vertical velocity at once, if we hit like a corner or something, it could bug out. It could pick the wrong uh, side to, you know, react with first. And so in general, with collision systems, we separate the application of velocities to two different axes, and then we check the collisions in between. If I were to write this out um, in some like text file here, it would be um, move x position, check x collisions and then move y position and then check y collisions that's sort of the bread and butter and it could be either or you could do y first x first it's whatever okay so now that we have that set up let's go ahead and run this and see what happens so i'm going to press right and that is really fast <laughs> that is very very fast so let's go ahead and reduce that down Okay, so let's go ahead and just set this to like five and negative five. Now we can move and you'll see that when we press it, it just starts moving in that direction. And the reason is because whenever we're pressing it, we're setting the velocity to five or negative five and we have no way to keep track of when we let go of the key to reset it to zero. Now, a really easy hotfix for this is just to set velocity x to zero, and then if nothing is pressed, then we, it will just be zero by the time we leave this update method. This is a really, really easy way to make a very rudimentary um, control scheme here. So there you go, we're moving about, and if nothing's pressed, then it just lets go. Cool. We're going to upgrade this in the future, but for now, that's a little bare bones moving left and right. The next thing we want to do is we want to apply gravity. Now. It's tempting to just do like velocity.y equals five here. And if we run this, we'll see that we have something similar to gravity. You'll actually see that I am falling like gravity. But the problem is that gravity in real life does not move at some like static velocity constant. It moves at an acceleration constant, meaning the velocity is growing over time. And so what we need to do is we need to add to velocity. So I'm going to be adding and add a small number because this is happening every single frame. So add an amount to velocity every single frame. And I recommend setting a cap. And the way you can do a cap is you can just say like, if velocity.y is greater than, what should we say, like 10, then we'll say velocity.y equals 10. And if you want a shorthand for this, it's the exact same thing as doing velocity.y equals math 
dot min of the top level you want and then the, just the velocity itself these are the same thing so there we, there we go we will be falling up until or we'll, we'll be accelerating up until our terminal velocity of 10. let's go ahead and run this and we are accelerating a little slowly i will say so why don't we go ahead and change this to uh, 0.5 here and then maybe change this to 20 and that might give smoother results and maybe 25. not terrible not terrible but we'll go ahead and tweak the settings in, in, the, in a bit Let's go ahead and get some jumping working. So we want to jump only when we are immediately pressing the space bar. We don't want to register a jump every single frame that we're holding down the key. So let's go ahead and get that implemented. This is going to be our jumping here. First thing we want to do is we want to say if key state dot is key down, keys dot, I'm going to do space for mine. Then we have to make sure that the previous frame we didn't have it pressed. And this ensures that this is the first frame that we're pressing space. So we'll do and not previous key state that is key down keys dot space then we want to jump and for jumping i'll just set a velocity constant for y to some negative value i'll do negative 10 why not go ahead and run this we can then jump check that out but you'll notice that we can um basically float here we're like flying and there's no way to basically say hey you're not on the ground you shouldn't be able to jump so you also notice that if we are standing on this ledge here and we go off we just snap to the ground which is not really what we want we want it to be this sort of smooth floaty thing a little bit and so let's go ahead and fix these two issues the first one we'll fix is the ledge one so i have my collision resolution in the update method but if yours isn't a player uh the player class itself then that also works perfectly fine. But basically what we wanna do is whenever we collide with the top of a tile, we are hitting the ground, right? So we want to do two things. One, we wanna reset the velocity. We don't want to be at max velocity, at our terminal velocity when we're standing still. We want it to reset to some very low number. Additionally, we also wanna notify the player that it is grounded now and can jump. So the first thing we'll do is whenever we collide with the top face, so this is colliding with the top face, then what we want to do is we want to say player.velocity.y equals, and I recommend some very low number, so I'm going to do 1.0 here. This will get rid of that effect of just snapping to the ground. So let's go back up there, let's walk off, and you can see that we don't just snap to the ground. We, are, we do a little bit of air time before we hit there. Now for implementing grounded, I've noticed that my player is spawning over air, which is not good, so I'm going to put it a little bit higher up. So we're gonna put it at um, three over and then zero at the top here. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to have to add a new property to the player. So I'm gonna just say uh, public boolean grounded. And I'm doing a property here because it seems to be the convention for um, C Sharp to do properties whenever you want things that are publicly accessed. So we're gonna have this property grounded here. By default, we want grounded to be false. Now it's tempting to just say, whenever we press the space bar here, we set grounded to false, which would make sense for some implications. But the problem is that this doesn't account for, let's say, walking off a cliff. If we walk off a cliff, we are in the air, but we haven't pressed space. So it's not okay to just put grounded here. Instead, it makes more sense to put it in the collision section. And again, we can use a very similar hack to the thing we did with the um, X component of velocity. We can just set player.grounded equal to false at the top here. And then if we do have a collision, we'll set player.grounded equal to true here. Now, this won't actually do anything if, we're not, if we don't actually care about the grounded property. So what we have to do now is in the jump, we add one more condition. If we are grounded and we press space, then we want to apply it. So boom, we can jump, but we can't. I'm spamming space, we cannot do that. And if we walk off this cliff, we can't jump until we hit the ground. That is basically a very, very simple platformer. Well, let's go ahead and add like one thing here. Why not? So we'll notice that when the player moves around, the guy is only looking in one direction no matter where he's going. And that's not very cool. So let's go ahead and make it so that when you move right, he actually flips right. This can be done, again, by adding uh, another property to our sprite. I'm going to do a public int direction here, and again, just make it a get set. And this direction will be um, negative one for left, one for right. You could also make this an enum if you want, but I am lazy. Now let's go ahead and when we initialize things, good practice to give it some default value. So I'll say direction equals negative one for left. Okay, now what we'll do is we will simply 
keep track of the direction here. So what we want to do is basically, if we change the direction, we then want to change the source rectangle to basically flip it, to mirror on the x-axis. And the way we can do that is we can just take the source rex width and we can multiply it. So a quick and easy way to do this is to just keep track of the direction and see if it changes. So what I'll do now is I'll say int previous direction equals the current direction. And then what we'll say is we'll say whenever we press right, we'll say direction equals one. And then whenever we press left, direction equals negative one. And then at the end, we'll just do a little check. So if previous direction does not equal direction, then what we want to do is we want to flip the source rectangle on the width. And the way we do that is we basically um, take the negative of the width and then we have to move the x over a bit. So how do we do this? Well, what we have to do is we have to do first srect.x plus equals srect.width. And then what we have to do is we have to do srect.width equals negative srect.width. And this should just work. So as you can see, when I press right and left, we are now we now have the player moving towards where it is pointing. Pretty cool stuff. And of course, this isn't like a full on extensive animation here, but now it looks a bit more like a platformer. Let's go ahead and add a double jump because that's a pretty iconic thing for platformers to have. For this, let's go ahead and add another property and I'll say, I'll make it private because there's no real reason for other things to know about it. Private, number of jumps, and then here I'll just say the number of jumps equals two, why not? And then I'll make another property, I'll say private int jump counter, and the jump counter is going to keep track of how many jumps we've used. So jump counter equals zero. Okay, so now that we've added this jump, num jumps and jump counter property here, we can go ahead and change our jumping logic. Instead of checking for grounded, what we wanna do is we wanna say if the jump counter is less than the, num the number of jumps that we are allowed to take. And then if we are actually able to successfully enter in this jump conditional, we want to increase the jump counter. Finally, what we want to do is we want to basically reset this whenever we're grounded. So we'll go over to where we have our collisions. And whenever we're saying player.grounded equals true, we'll also say player.jump counter. Uh, oops, we need to actually, I actually do need to make it uh, public just for this example. Um, so public int jump counter, I will say the player's jump counter equals zero, basically resetting our jumps. So now we can jump once, jump twice, but we can only jump twice. Okay, so now we have another issue here. So this works perfectly fine for double jumps on ground, but if we walk off a cliff, we can still double jump. And this is a weird little issue that is has a kind of a janky fix. What we wanna do is we want to check if we have fallen off the cliff, but we haven't jumped. And so what we'll basically do is we'll check this. At the end of our checking for collisions, after we've done all our collisions, we'll say, if we are not grounded, so we are no longer in the ground, or lo no longer on the ground, and, and here we go, and the player's jump counter equals zero, that means that we haven't jumped, we've actually just walked off the cliff, then we want to just increment it. So increment jump counter by one. So we can double jump here, but we walk off and we can only do one more jump. This is the kind of like Smash Bros style jumping where you can only jump once after falling off a cliff, but you can double jump otherwise. So I can do this sort of stuff here. Pretty cool stuff. I would be remiss to not include Delta Time as a fundamental component of making a good player controller. So Delta time, if you don't know what it is, it literally just means the change in time. And this is very important when designing platformers because not everyone has the exact same laptop as you. And so when you're designing a platformer, I'm putting these arbitrary numbers, five, one, 10 here, and it runs well on my machine. Now let's get someone with a terrible machine, integrated graphics, nothing good. They try to run this, it's gonna be a different experience. And the reason is because they are seeing less frames. This this is being called less amount of times. So the player is just going to actually move slower. And so we don't want this to happen. And the way that we can alter this is by introducing delta time. And basically, 
This just means that we, anytime we move the velocity, we just tack on delta time and we're all set. The problem is that delta time is really, really small. And so we do have to make some adjustments to our values in order for the player to actually move. To show you what I'm, what I'm talking about, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna first grab delta time from game time by saying float dt equals game time dot elapsed game time dot total seconds. And then we have to typecast it to a float from a double. What we can then do is just go around and every, every time we mess with the velocity, we want to add dt. And that's not velocity, that is direction. <laughs> add dt here and add dt here. Now what you'll notice is that we are frozen. And the reason is because, and you see that we very slowly moved down. The reason is because, let's just go ahead and print out delta time. Let's see what it actually is. Console.writeline delta time. Let's go ahead and let print this out here. As you can see, 0 0.0166667. That is microscopic. So how do we fix this? Well, I like to just make my numbers a lot bigger. And so for adding to this velocity, I'm going to start adding 50 per frame. And then adding the velocity dot x, I will start setting this to maybe 100. Could that be good? I'm actually not sure. I haven't tested this before this. And then for the jumping, I'm going to do 250. Maybe that'll work. Let's go ahead and run it. Oh, well, the gravity seemed fine, but it seems like the jumping is weak. Maybe the gravity should be a little bit lower. Let's go ahead and change it to 15, and let's make the, gra the um, jumping power 300. Okay, well, the jumping is still weak, and now the gravity is way too high. So let's go ahead and change that as well, or way too low. So let's go ahead and put this back to like 35, and I'll make the jump power 600. And then I'm also gonna make the horizontal movement like three times faster, because that was way too slow. Boom, look at that, we have a nice platformer. And I don't really have a way to show you, but this should ideally run at the same speed. Like I should be moving and jumping at the same speed and height on any device. And this is thanks to using Delta Time. Now there is one more addition to add, and this is the idea of friction. So you'll notice that when I let go of the keyboard, player immediately stops. And for some people, this is what you want. For others, you might want it to be a little more realistic or you might want to add a bit more challenge to the controls. So you might want a little bit of a slowdown when moving here. And the way that we can do that is we just, instead of just setting the value, we would then increment the value. So what this would be, what this would become is we would do plus equals and then something lower than 300, more like 30. And this would be plus equals negative 30 times all the time. Then what we would do is after changing these velocity components, we would then um, apply the friction and constrict the values. So the first thing we'll do is we'll constrict the values. So I'm gonna do a shorthand for this. So we'll do velocity.x equals math.max. And then we put our min value here. And I, I don't want this to go any faster than negative 300. And then for the, um, the other value, I'm gonna do math.min. And I don't want this to go any faster than 300. And then for the final one, I'm gonna do velocity.x. This is basically saying, stay within negative 300 to 300. Okay, so now let's go ahead and apply that friction because what you'll notice here is this will be really hard to control with no friction. So this is a frictionless surface now. Oh, additionally, we have to then get rid of this step here where we we're just setting velocity to x to zero so that we no longer reset our velocity every frame. What we then do is we run the program and you'll notice that with no friction, this becomes a very slippery process. That is even buggy because of how large it gets. Quick interjection here, I just noticed a bug in the original collision code that can be resolved pretty quickly. Um, we want to, whenever we grab the collision intersections, um, there is a little bit of inaccuracy. And so adding this extra line of, if we don't collide with the collision rectangle, just continue on, which means skip over this and go to the next one. If you add this to here and add this to here, it will avoid this clipping that I've been seeing with these um, weird circumstances on the corners of tiles. So there's no more clipping with that implementation. Sorry about that. So how do we fix this? Well, first make sure that we restrict this to a reasonable value here. And then the next thing that we do is we then just apply the friction. So there's a really easy way to do this. We'll say velocity.x times equals 0.95f. And this is kind of our friction constant here. And this will basically just mean that we will be slowing down at a constant rate. 
Okay, back to the video here. As you can see, the uh, friction is actually working and we do have a quite a slippery surface here. Um, so of course, you know, tweak this to your desires and you can actually, you know, if you have a way to grab the current tile you're on, if you could have tiles store their own friction constants so you can have like ice in your, in your world or like some uh, gravel or sand that makes it slower to walk on, that's a cool little addition too. But I think with all of that, that about wraps up the video for today. Um, we implemented a pretty decent play Player controller here with some movement, some double jumps, and some friction. Um, if you want an, an extended video on this, let me know and I'll add some more features too. Um, and if you want some one on like an RPG controller, that would also be cool. With that being said, please join my Discord if you have any questions. I will be answering all the questions there. And also consider supporting me on Patreon. You get your name featured at the end of the video if you'd like, and you get access to um, certain projects that I'm cooking in the background and some source code upon request. So yeah, thanks for watching. Have a good day. See ya.